afternoon to many members, staff, and members of the community watching. I'll now call the March 23rd, 2021 Policy Committee meeting to order. Due to the current federal and state emergency declarations, this meeting is being conducted in accordance with Minnesota Statute 13D.021, with some members participating remotely. This meeting is being live streamed on our website and recording will be posted there and also run on channel 15. Before we begin, I'll remind everyone of a few virtual meeting requirements and tips. We will take all votes by roll call. Ryan will serve as our clerk today and call the roll when needed. Board members and staff, please mute yourselves when not talking to avoid background noise. Remember to speak clearly, slowly into your microphone. Directors participating remotely, please use the raise your hand feature to be recognized. Thanks. Ryan, will you please call the roll? Director Ali. Director Arneson. Here. Director Cerillo. Director Ellison. Here. Director Polly. Here. Thank you. Could I please get a motion to approve the agenda with last name for the record? Um, so moved, Arneson. Is there a second? second. Oh, thank you. So our agenda has been moved and seconded. If there's any discussion, please raise your hand to be recognized. Seeing none, Ryan, will you please call the roll? Arneson. Yes. Ellison. Yes. Polly. Yes. Thank you. So that motion carries. We have an approved agenda. Next is the approval of minutes from the February 23rd, 2021 meeting. Can I get a motion to approve the minutes as presented with the last name? So moved, Arneson. Second, Ellison. Oh, thank you both. So the minutes have been moved and seconded. If there's any discussion, please raise your hand. Seeing none, Ryan, will you please call the roll? Arneson. Yes. Ellison. Yes. Polly. Yes, thank you. That motion carries and the minutes are approved. For our next item, we will continue our topic from last month and hear more specifics on the findings and resulting plans of the EDA on community education. Superintendent Graff, if you'd like to go ahead. Thank you, Chair Pauly. Uh, as mentioned, as a follow-up to last month's discussion, uh, we do have Senior Officer Moore here to provide some additional background and details on the EDIA's uh, the Equity Diversity Impact Assessments that were conducted on uh, community education uh, programming and out-of-school time opportunities. Um, I'd also want to acknowledge that we have uh, joining Senior Officer Moore is Community Education Executive Director Anthony Williams, who's here as well. So with that, I will turn it over to um, Senior Officer Moore and you can present when ready. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Director Polly. Uh, so, um, Chair Ellison, members of the board, Superintendent Graff, it's uh, my pleasure to have the opportunity to have a follow-up discussion with you regarding the uh, community education uh, partial equity diversity impact assessment. Uh, and um, just check and see if I have control, Ryan. You might have to drive here, it's not working on my end. Okay, uh, so if you recall the last conversation uh, that we had the opportunity to engage in is, is we talked about uh, the EDIA beginning with the, uh, with a, uh, the beginning was a full equity diversity impact assessment, uh, which is identified in policy 1304. And as uh, over the years, as we've become engaged in the process and have done a significant number of learnings, we've also uh, derived some derivatives uh, from that process uh, including an equity considerations process for budgeting. Uh, we currently use that process to make sure that as for budgeting, uh, that we're taking into account who are impacted with our budgetary decisions. Uh, if there is uh, harm on particular groups, how do we mitigate that? If we're not able to mitigate the harm uh, regarding a budgetary decision, uh, th then uh, we reassess the decisions we make. And so that's a part of our budget tie out process. Uh, there will be, we're currently in the process of doing some analysis, uh, both at the department level as well as the school level for budgeting. We also have an equity considerations process for policies. 
Uh, and uh, this is a result of wanting to view every policy uh, that we have that may not merit a full equity diversity impact assessment based on the criteria, but uh, everything that we do, we wanna make sure that we're, we're using our lens of equity. Uh, and so uh, that equity considerations for policy process uh, involves uh, the owner of a particular policy. In this case, each of the senior officers uh, is responsible for policies. So it's so a policy. Uh, my unit works with, the, the accountability research equity unit works with then that senior officer uh, to look at the policies through an equity lens. And so as those policies are presented to you at the policy committee, uh, we've, uh, you can have confidence that we've gone through this process. Uh, and then there's also the equity considerations for practices. Uh, this is uh, uh, any major practice we do, but this also, this area would apply to uh, examination of practices within departments. And if you recall previous EDIs, I'll use the, the equity diversity impact assessment, for example, human resources. That would be a, an example of a previous equity diversity impact assessment that we've completed. Now it would be considered an equity considerations for practices in that uh, sense, to what extent have we, are we doing practices uh, regarding recruitment and retention of teachers of color? So that would be an example of a former EDIA uh, because our current EDI is focused on policy. Uh, so we do the equity consideration for, for policies uh, and the full EDI would meet a criteria um, which you're aware of uh, meeting a certain threshold. Next slide. So uh, tonight we're gonna talk about uh, community education. Community education, if you recall, we, we actually began a partial equity diversity impact assessment committee. And as mentioned uh, by Director Polly, uh, we wanted to go deeper at the request of the policy committee into the results of this equity diversity impact assessment. Uh, but uh, before I begin, I'd like to uh, share the floor a bit with the Executive Director Anthony Williams, uh, just for him to give you an overview of, of community education. Well, thank you, uh, Senior Officer Moore, and good afternoon, uh, Chair Ellison, members of the board, and Superintendent Graff. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to be here to be able to talk, to talk about the equity assessment that we did a few years ago with community education. And while that is focused on our, our you know, uh, after school program in the OST, you know, uh, the work of community education really encompasses, you know, uh, working with uh, the whole family. You know, we have our adult education program, uh, which serves our, you know, our adults ages 17 and up, working with them around, you know, career pathways, um, secondary education attainment, and things of that nature, and just working with families in general. Our youth in enrichment programs and our adult enrichment programs just provide opportunities for our, our students after school. Um, and then our Minneapolis Kids uh, programs, which provides our before and after school care for many of our families. Um, at the time of this assessment, we did have um, City of Lakes AmeriCorps, which was a part of community education that has not since transitioned um, to under the multilingual department. Um, and we still, you know, uh, work with communities on facility access. Um, and then since then as well, not which I'll talk more about later on in the presentation, you know, we have uh, been fortunate to bring in um, full service community schools, you know, at our at our City View and Green location, as well as the, in partnership with uh, with Bethune and the Minneapolis Park, Parks and Recs. Um, the work of community education really uh, focuses on the holistic approach to addressing and supporting the entire family. So we have our before and after school, we have our after school, and we have our family engagement components. So, um, yeah, I look forward to talk, discussing the EDIA and um, the findings of the, in, the inequities within the department and then um, the mitigation things we've put in place. Our focus this year, you know, even with COVID in place, has really been moving past you know, courageous conversations into courageous actions. We've looked at specific things, you know, um, that have had, that we, we, we identified as inequities, inequities and have taken steps um, to address those things on a micro level, um, realizing that taking those steps to address those will impact the macro level. So that's where we are. Um, I look forward to sharing more later on in the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Anthony. I mean, I, I really appreciate uh, uh, the, the idea of going from courageous conversations to courageous actions. And, and, and to that extent, that's the accountability that, that we're all looking for, uh, both uh, internally within the organization. I think our community expects that from us as well. Uh, just quickly, here's the timeline. Uh, I just, and this, I shared this previously, but 
uh, you know, we had 2017, 18, the board did request an EDIA on Minneapolis kids. And as mentioned, we did a partial, uh, we uh, shifted uh, at the request uh, as we were doing the partial EDIA, uh, began that process. Uh, but as we moved into spring 2019, it was put on hold uh, because of the um, work around the conference of district design. Uh, but we did uh, do interviews, focus groups. We, we have some program descriptions we'll share tonight. And we did identify some inequities. Um, and tonight, Anthony will respond uh, to those inequities uh, concretely with some action steps. And also there's been some evolution within the community education uh, department uh, relative to some of the findings here, which, which we're proud to share. Uh, this is just uh, data after school program offering. So athletics in 1819, uh, 35 high school program, uh, 35 uh, programs for grades seven, 12. So you see a number of, of programs. So it's 35 programs for grades seven and 12. 2018 Minneapolis Kids. Minneapolis Kids, uh, we'll talk about that tonight, but that is a program that provides uh, school age care before and after school um, on non-school days and during the summer. Uh, you will see some data that will show some equities regarding Minneapolis Kids and um, Executive Director Williams will have a chance to, to address that uh, tonight. Youth programming also includes after school academic and enrichment programs. And we are also, um, as part of, the, uh, of that uh, youth programming, uh, we have community based organizations we partner with, such as Beacons. You see the locations listed below, um, as well as Eastside Neighborhood Services. Extended learning uh, this is our credit recovery, this is our target services. Uh, uh, thinking about those programs as our credit recovery. Um, but the goal is to increase academic achievement, ultimately leading to, to graduation. Um, and you see that uh, we often do uh, community-based organizations. We partner with community-based organizations for extended learning opportunities as well. I wanted to uh, show you uh, participation by zone. Um, and, uh, you know, when I, it, it's actually fairly proportional. What you don't see here is we also did an analysis looking to see to what extent is participation proportional uh, by zone one, two, and three. And I believe in it within uh, the PowerPoint, you see the zones identified, uh, but, but you see that uh, you know, there's three sites, uh, athletics, uh, zone one, two, and zone two, two, and zone three. Uh, the, the numbers are comparable uh, and relative to the proportion of the populations um, in the different zones. Um, you do see a significant disparity on Minneapolis kids. Uh, where zone three, you see the majority of Minneapolis kids offerings, and that's a fee-based program. Uh, but you see that uh, it's disproportionately those programs are in zone three, followed by zone two and zone one. And so this is an area I've asked uh, Executive Director Williams to address uh, when we talk about um, some of the challenges um, with fee-based programs. Uh, but you do see a, a significant difference between zones for Minneapolis kids. Uh, in terms of youth enrichment, again, uh, uh, relatively proportional uh, to the population. Zone one, you see more sites. Uh, when you, uh, um, the 3,200, though, you, what you would see is smaller participation. So you have more sites, but those classes are smaller uh, in zone one. Uh, but, but relatively, they're within the same range uh, for youth enrichment programming. Extended learning, you do see more programs in zone one. Again, those are your credit recovery programs. Uh, some of your academic achievement programs. And so you do see um, more programs in zone one there. Uh, relative to academic data, I mean, I think that does, uh, when we look at um, um, academic achievement by zone, uh, that's responding to a need uh, in terms of uh, students uh, behind in credits, which is aligned to our much larger issue, which I believe we'll talk about tonight, um, and the committee of the whole rel relative to achievement gaps. Um, and, and academic performance based on race. But uh, you do see more programs in zone one uh, for extended learning. Uh, participation by gender is slightly skewed. We have uh, slightly more males participating. Um, free and reduced lunch, uh, you see, see more students participating, not eligible for free and reduced lunch. Uh, I would say some of that uh, um, is, 
some of that difference it can be attributed to the, the Minneapolis kids. I mean, that does impact uh, some of that when we looked at at the, the nature of um, zone one, two, and three. Uh, by race, it's relatively uh, proportional. However, uh, there is some um, over proportionality for a white population, represents 37% of our district population and 48% of participants uh, in the athletics area. Um, so, so you do see uh, th those are areas that we look at as well. Minneapolis kids, again, you see the, the gender uh, difference. Um, you know, uh, relative to, we, we've mentioned this before, Minneapolis kids fee-based program, 72% white. Um, and, and again, uh, when you look at zones one, two, and three, zone three would be uh, predominantly white, so that is uh, in alignment with some of the uh, previous data that, that I was able to show you. Uh, but Minneapolis kids is one uh, that I think does merit discussion. Youth education programs, it looks relatively proportional. Extended learning, uh, again, more participation in uh, free and reduced lunch. Uh, aligned to zone one. Zone one would have a higher proportion of students that are eligible for free and reduced lunch. Uh, you see a slightly more uh, students of color, um, our, our student of color population is more highly correlated uh, with eligibility for free and reduced lunch. So, so this, this data here is not a surprise uh, in terms of participation by race and free and reduced lunch and extended learning. So let's look at uh, some of the findings. As mentioned, uh, this is uh, a community education. We can skip this slide as well. Uh, we did map, uh, so this is uh, a, a four year. Uh, we did map uh, our programming. Uh, and so uh, we added uh, youth enrichment, adult, uh, you know, the, as well as the Beacons programs. Uh, so in some cases, you're gonna see uh, a more, um, depending on zone, more opportunities for the fee-based programs in zone three, um, you will see more youth enrichment programs, um, uh, beacons type programs in, in zone one and two. Um, and I think Anthony can talk about that, but the idea is to try to offer after school programming in some cases or before programming, there's a fee. In other cases, there's not, but the goal is to provide opportunities for after school programming and before school programming, regardless of zone. Here are the, the issues, and I'll mention them again. I, you know, we, we did add some information, um, but we did find some inequities uh, in student support services, as mentioned at the last policy committee, inconsistent practices uh, regarding the behavior policy, being inclusive. Um, we also saw that our staffing, high uh, turnover of staffing, uh, per consistency of staffing is a challenge. Uh, I know that uh, Executive Director Williams is working uh, to close with human resources uh, to address these issues. Uh, mitigation plan, uh, you see that um, uh, there are some efforts uh, around um, uh, professional development to ensure more consistency and applying the behavior policy as well as working uh, better with students uh, with special needs. Uh, you also see um, more attention to policy in terms of um, authorization forms for medication. Uh, providing um, uh, alternative snacks, uh, relative to staffing, you see more creative recruiting, uh, trying to access community uh, members, uh, community contacts to get more diversity of staff. Um, also uh, supporting uh, working with external partners. Uh, there has been some hiring of multilingual staff, um, but, the, but there's ongoing training uh, with leaders. Um, also working with Grow Your Own uh, type programming. So to having youth workers um, you know, students we work with become those youth workers in the future. Youth enrichment inequities. Uh, we know that uh, similar to other registration processes, uh, the registration process will not work with all families. We know that there's inconsistencies in fee structures across sites. We know that there's some challenges in program offerings not available for all grade levels. Um, some cases, no programs on Fridays and transportation challenges. Uh, also, marketing, uh, there we are we're identified gaps in terms of translations, um, inconsistent representation of programming and some of the marketing. And so the mitigation plan um, was to use different 
uh, multiple registration methods and strategies online, paper, phone, in person, uh, to reach a variety of, of different groups with different preferences for uh, registration and, and for um, understanding availability of programs. Uh, there's also a bit more flexibility uh, for grade level offerings, uh, more attention to uh, communication via review bus information for every participant, to doing robocalls with broad updates, uh, more attention to translating policies in multiple languages and doing more targeted marketing to ensure that all groups are able to participate. Minneapolis kids, uh, we know, and I think the data showed uh, uh, affordability. So Minneapolis kids is a fee-based program. And so it's not accessible for all. Um, it's not located in every building. It's located in 22 buildings across the district. But as you saw on the data, uh, predominantly in, in Southwest, uh, uh, Minneapolis, these are 13 sites there. Uh, transportation is not always available for families between home and program. Uh, behavior management students lack of consistent use of positive behavior intervention strategies, and it's not necessarily accessible uh, to all families due to space and staffing limitations. Uh, so uh, in the mitigation plan, uh, there's a commitment to continue to share information uh, about applying for child care assistant program and, and partner with nonprofit scholarships to support families to participate in those fee-based programs. Uh, utilizing data to assess ongoing enrollment, so uh, deeper detail to look to see who is enrolling, who's participating, and, and the reasons why they are not. I uh, continue to develop positive engagement plans, continue to focus on staff training, uh, and, and continue to partner with other departments. And so, um, and there's actually a recruitment task force uh, to support um, some of the, the concerns identified regarding diverse staff. And just, I just wanted to share also the adult education. So um, as mentioned, pedagogy uh, needs curriculum instruction can be more flexible to respond to those student attendance. Um, resources, so it appears to be limited resources, less timely support for students with disabilities on the north side, north Minneapolis. Uh, staffing and skills, so, so we wanna have more diverse staff. Um, and, and there's some issues regarding teacher pay uh, opportunities to build teacher skills have to do with professional development. Uh, so community education has been offering a distance learning option. Uh, there is um, creating a more welcoming atmosphere, uh, different ways to advertise for the program, more focused professional development, focusing on um, anti-racism, working with different groups of, of, of families, reflecting our district, uh, being more uh, flexible on the class offerings in terms of location, the timing, uh, using distance learning so the online platform to reach more families, uh, being more adaptive with the curriculum, and also um, partnering with Metro Transit. Um, offerings, uh, not, the size of programs vary across city. Uh, many of the more suitable buildings of Zone 1 are programmed by community partner organizations, as mentioned, uh, YWCA, YMCA, Boys and Girls Club. Um, there is a limited number, the finding was, of culturally relevant offerings, so something to pay attention to. Um, program fit, uh, there seemed to be some incongruency between the types of programs offered and the fit for the diverse populations. Uh, so the mitigation plan is, again, more efforts on uh, finding diverse staff, trying to have more flexibility on having a range of offering fees, uh, doing more work with building relationships across different departments uh, so that facilities are, are available, uh, creating a feedback system, and then obviously explore connections on the school day with, with uh, community education programs, doing more connecting of youth to adult programs. So I'm gonna turn it over to um, Executive Director Williams and let him talk a bit more the changes to community education since 2018, 2019 and then I think there's probably some questions as um, board members you may wanna have regarding some of the data that, that you showed. I'm happy to elaborate on anything that I, I presented. Thank you, Mr. Um, I do wanna to touch on, before I jump into the slides, just uh, you know you had mentioned sort of the inequities in zone one, two, and three with Minneapolis kids and it, and it being a fee-based program. And we, rec we recognize that. And you know, um, we do say in zone one and zone two, there are, 
Uh, while we don't have the efforts to get to the zone one and zone two at the levels we have in zone three, there are community-based opportunities that are provided, you know, um, that typically are free or cheaper, you know, the Minneapolis kids will be in those areas. And then there also, there's also a uh, competition at times because we offer a uh, free after school programming through our youth enrichment. So if we offer Minneapolis kids at some of those exact same sites, they, it becomes a conflict in that way. People choose free over, over fee a lot of the times. Um, that being said, we don't want that to, to limit our ability to make these offerings, you know, um, and at times when we have uh, typically a more, you know, robust fund balance and, you know, we can also explore meeting um, the needs of, of the community in a different way. But, you know, this has been a, a tough our, our fiscal year, as you all are aware. Um, diving into, you know, where we are um, and some initiatives we put in place, you know, to address the, the, the findings of the EDIA, you know, one of the things, one of the reoccurring themes came out about staffing, you know, our, you know, um, the diversity of our staffing and especially amongst leadership, not just, you know, um, hiring more staff or, or diversifying, you know, um, you know, at, at the entry level positions, but diversifying the leadership. You know, uh, when I first uh, started in community education, I was the only person of color who was in a leadership position. And um, on this, on the slide here, it says too, that's because the second person of color I hired in that position. So we had, you know, we were uh, 13%, you know, um, just at the time of this uh, EDIA. Since then, we have, you know, really diversified our leadership staff and we continue to work to do so. We're now up to 40%. And this is our, what we consider our, our tier one leadership, which is our management and supervisors. Um, and then it's, it's even broader um, when you go down to what, what would be our uh, tier two, like site level leadership. Um, that diversification is also implemented there. One of the things that that we've done, you know, outside of just being intentional about, you know, being inclusive in our hiring practices, you know, um, being ma making sure that we had that we are interviewing enough people of color uh, is also has been working with HR around dismantling some of the barriers that people face to just being willing to apply. You know, um, sometimes those minimal minimal qualifications can just be frightening when you when you read those and you may have a skill set or things of that nature. So I've been working with HR and my team's been working with HR to really uh, look at those minimum qualifications and not to change those, but to identify the and or. You know, it'll, it'll say, you know, four year degree and five years experience and or this. So we've been working to identify the and or criteria which really meets the need of our positions, which allows for many more community members to be able to, to apply for, uh, for these opportunities. So that, that's one uh, strategy we're taking when it comes to staffing, as well as, uh, as, as you read about uh, earlier on, I'm looking at, you know, um, through our negotiation process, looking at, you know, our contracts with our teachers and things of that nature from adult education. Um, we have, you know, invested quite a bit into professional development over the years. Um, and there was another thing that came up was around equity, you know, um, especially around how we treat our students. Uh, so we've been invested in, you know, leadership development for all of our, all of our leaders, um, trauma-informed instruction, mindfulness, and uh, Equity PD, I'm working with, you know, uh, a number of professionals. I think most recently was William Drew, who I think we're working with again in the district, you know, um, to provide some of those PD opportunities for staff. Um, we can continue to plan to build more of those, um, equipping staff with the tools, to, the tools needed to effectively engage, not just our, our youth and our students, but also our entire family. That's one of the priorities um, of ours. If you can go to the next slide. Uh, some of our key initiatives since the since the EDIA, I talked about you know our full service community schools, which is really focused on meeting the needs of the entire family as well, bringing in resources. Um, this year has been a challenging year with with COVID, but we've you know held a number of events, uh, provided families with resources, as well as been a space for students to you know connect with those full service community school coordinators about their needs and connecting them through our our OS3 uh, huddles. So since we're not on site, we have virtual huddles. We've been able to register, you know, um, you know, quite a few students upwards, I think around 2,000 students. Um, down from our normal year, but still to get students virtually online, it's been a good, a, a good uh, return. Uh, we have developed equity and engagement teams at both of our adult education, as well as our uh, youth enrichment programs, you know, to address, you know, additional equity concerns. Um, those are teams made up of colleagues who focus on equity issues within that program area. We are in the process with our Minneapolis kids um, area, which we know we need is, a, is an area of, you know, we have to be very intentional with. We're in the process of developing first a shared leadership team to bring in some more staff voice 
and then it'll trickle from there to the to them creating the equity team. Um, you know, uh, next this upcoming school year um, to really uh, look at our offerings, working with the principals. We have met with a number of principals about you know their needs and looking at their offerings and how we can you know uh, continue to address those needs in the community. Um, one of the things, and I'll bring this up, you know, uh, is around what we're doing with adult education and the adult diploma. One of the reoccurring themes there was access, you know, um, and opportunity. Uh, you know, we we used to really focus on the GED, and we have shift. We, we still focus on the GED. But we have shifted to um, offering now the adult diploma, um, which is you know created by the state of Minnesota to provide other another avenue for adults to gain that secondary credential, and then also um, attach attaching that to our career pathways where they can also obtain employment within the district. You know, so once again, it's that holistic family approach. Um, Cause if, if, you know, if the parents are doing well, the kids will do better. That's, if, uh, if I believe. On the next slide, I think there might be one more. Uh, one other major initiative that we're working on, which really addresses the whole community. Uh, while we have our full service community schools at, at, uh, at CDU Bethune, and green, we have our comprehensive uh, workforce center, which we have partnership with at 800 West Broadway. That's another area where we've been able to really uh, work to, to meet the needs of the community when it comes to food distribution, so uh, resource distribution, education opportunities, employment opportunities. Uh, we've been able to meet that need right there at that location throughout the pandemic. So um, that's something that, you know, uh, has been an initiative that's been in place. Um, I think this is the fourth year of that initiative. Uh, and then I talked about access a little bit. You know, we uh, our youth and adult enrichment program, you know, is typically low cost or free. You know, we have piloted additional sliding fail, sliding scale offerings for families. I mean, some are in, in, in some other schools. We're also looking at when it talks about access, you know, some of the schools don't have youth enrichment opportunities. You know, that's because even though um, it's, it's broader, broader available, more broadly available for our community, uh, it's still a fee based program. So, we can't we can't you know put it in every single school but we can as a community education department still support schools who may not have a full-time community education coordinator and to find enrichment activities for their students that's a commitment um that i've made this year and i've worked with a couple of principals to you know for next school year to even though they may not have a community education program they'll have enrichment activities for their for their students uh, adult education you know i you know i talked about uh we switched our practices from from enforcing strict attendance policies to focusing on student engagement. That means we went from having policies that really uh, put students in a box and had, hey, you have to come to our program this way. And we modified the program and said, we'll meet your needs. If you can't come four or five days a week, we'll figure out a plan where you can come two days a week and you can be online or you can do this, that. So, you know, that's a, a mitigation strategy we apply with adult education. And then um, and I talked about Minneapolis kids, the number of schools reached out about hosting sites. We can't host at every site. But we can, you know, look at ways to, to you know, uh, get parents educated about the CCAP program. Also, you know, once we have a, a healthy reserve, we can look at, you know, um, subsidizing some program. And I don't want to say our parent, our families can't pay for things. But a lot of times we make that assumption about what families can and can't pay, you know. But we can subsidize some programs to get it up started, and then maybe at some point in time, families will have the ability to pay for the services. To these those are the commitments that we we've made as a department and the things we've done to address the inequities so far. So at this point, uh, I mean, that concludes the, the update on community education. And so um, certainly I'm available as well as uh, Executive Director Williams uh, for questions. Superintendent, I'll turn it over to you as well. Do you have any comments? Thanks, I just want to acknowledge that uh, this, this process of the equity diversity impact assessment has been something that has evolved in excuse me, appreciate the opportunity to bring this back um, to kind of update the, the board on where we are with the status of things. We know we had a, a kind of a pause, but appreciate um, Executive Director Williams' intentional efforts and, and certainly moving forward. I, I know we'll have more um, items to address in the community ed department and appreciate kind of foreshadowing um, the direction we're going right now. So I'll turn it back to you, Chair Pauley. Thank you, Superintendent Graff, and thank you, um, Executive Director Williams and Senior Officer Moore. Directors, please raise your hand to be recognized for, for questions or comments. Director Arneson. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. And uh, 
I'm glad if it's okay, Chair Polly, I have a couple of, I have a kind of a question, but then a couple of follow-ups, is, if that's okay, if we have time for that today. Great, thank you. And I wanna welcome Executive Director Williams. Welcome, uh, we maybe have met, but congratulations and thank you for being here today. Uh, I've, I've always seen community education as a huge asset for our school district and a huge asset for every single school and it's just, it's a benefit for our community. So I've always been um, a big believer in making sure that we can offer community education to its full to its full capacity because I know that our families really appreciate it and it's really something that a lot of dis it's unique to our district so we should it, it we should we should take advantage of that so I'm appreciative of um, all of, all of your efforts so as I kind of so my first question I, I I'm kind of trying to understand the status of our um, EDIA at this moment and then I have kind of a follow up depending on where we're at. So what I'm hearing us say is, and I, I understand it, we, we started the EDA process, and then we were working on the CDD, so we paused it. And in the meantime, there's a variety of different changes that happened, including some leadership changes at community education, and they did some kind of, took the initiative to do some work, like on their own, and, and I recognize and hear and, um, like the comments resonated with me here today. So what I'm kind of trying to understand is, are we now, where does that leave us? Are we going back to kind of complete the EDIA or have, are we kind of at the partial EDIA and now we're kind of moving towards the, I think we call it um, EDIA equity considerations during the budget. Like where are things at? Would somebody be, if superintendent, would you be willing to kind of clarify that? Yeah, I'll, I'll um, ask Senior Officer Moore to speak to it directly because this is something that we we processed a couple of years ago yeah. um, at a policy meeting where we talked about you know, trying to provide more clarity around who initiates an EDIA. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we did talk about a partial EDIA, EDIA and then move to the equity consideration. So I think the timing of this as such was we started with a, a partial and then concluded that it really, um, it was completed based on what we have, but it really didn't warrant um, moving forward uh, a full EDIA. That was okay. my recollection of the, the community ed kind of the decision around the EDIA. But Senior Officer Moore, do you wanna perhaps provide a little more specifics around our process for equity, diversity impact assessments? Absolutely, uh, thank you, Superintendent, uh, Chair Ellison, um, Director Arneson. Uh, at this point, uh, the, the process uh, is concluded other than um, setting targets. So we wanna set targets uh, for uh, the mitigation plan uh, strategy so that we can monitor. So we would be entering a monitoring phase. So the next step would be the identification of targets uh, to address uh, issues such as staffing. Sure. Um, and I think it was mentioned, I mean, you know, we ne normally we would have set the targets immediately after um, as, as part of this, but, but since we were interrupted, you, you've already seen the growth. For example, we would have set a target for uh, staff of color um, yeah. because that was something that was identified. Sure. They've already gone from 7% to I believe 40%. Okay. Uh, but, but we would be in the monitoring phase, Director Arneson. Okay, that's helpful. Um, so this would, it would be concluded at this point and then we would just monitor uh, and, and we do the quarterly monitoring uh, based on the areas identified in the mitigation plan. Okay, great. And I know that, um, uh, great. So in that case, then I wouldn't necessarily expect that this is going to come back to us, uh, Chair Polly, but maybe through the evaluation process, it will come. So we see this kind of through our yearly evaluation process yes. is where we see this again. Okay. So with that, then I have a couple of comments or follow-ups, I guess, based on what I uh, heard here today. And um, really, again, like I said, I, I appreciate many of the comments about the mitigation strategies and the things that have been previously identified. Uh, this is a program I follow really closely and those do uh, resonate, resonate with me as well. Um, but I did wanna talk a little bit, one of my primary concerns has always been youth enrichment and Executive Director Williams, you mentioned this as well. And I, I really, I heard you say that you're committed to kind of helping schools figure that out. And I, I deeply appreciate that. But what I wanted to kind of call the attention to or maybe ask a little bit more clarity on that is I've noticed in the data that you collected is you've grouped in our partners with Beacons. And I'm familiar with Beacons and it's a really great asset that we work with them. But I, I did wanna highlight, and I'm sure Executive 
Director Williams knows this, that Beacons, their focus and specialty is the middle years, the middle and high school years, not the K-5 years. And so we've kind of grouped together with youth enrichment, K-8, and kind of thrown in, uh, uh, not necessarily differentiating between the middle years enrichment and the elementary years enrichment. And this is, I think, particularly worth noting as we go into the CDD, like implementing the CDD, and have um, a lot of interest in really thinking about the developmental needs of our middle year kids, but also wanting enrichment for our elementary school age kids. So I think as we evaluate this in the future, it will be probably important to break that out. And I suspect uh, when you looked and you counted the totals and you had a slide that compared the different parts of the city and the participation, I suspect that in zone one, that participation may look similar, but I suspect it's a little heavier on the mm -hmm. 612 age group and a little lighter on the K-5. And I think in other parts of the city, it's much light, heavier on the K-5 and a little lighter on the 612. So I, I think that's a um, something worth, like in the future when we're reviewing this, um, breaking that out further to get a little bit deeper into what we want to accomplish with our kids. <clears throat> So I, I, um, I don't know if others disagree, but I, I wanted to at least <clears throat> um, raise that. But like I said, <clears throat> um, Director Williams, I appreciate that you said that there's this commitment to make sure that you figured it out. It is a fee-based program, but I have not really understood, at least in my community, it is really a source of tension. Like we have some schools that have really no enrichment opportunities and they have a community education director like six blocks away. <laughs> and I've never been really able to figure out why we can't figure out how to like have, like to make that work where we can have like something after the, at this school that's very physically close to the building, even fee-based, right? And I do wanna also highlight when we talk about the extended learning and as that as one of the after-school options, and I, that is absolutely, and I, this is well understood, but I, I think it's worth saying out loud that there is a difference between the extended learning opportunity and the enrichment opportunity and kind of the signal that that sends to a community when you can only offer them um, statewide, um, uh, basically tutoring, right? Like it's to, it's to statewide, there's a, it, that's run by the state, we all know. We have, there's very specific guidelines, there's very specific qualifications. And I know having spent years of watching and observing community education, I know community education staff have think about that as well. Like they think that there is, they would maybe approach philosophically that after school time differently than what the extended learning guidelines dictate. And so I, I think that there is value in trying to kind of um, think through being creative and offering the students what they need academically, but also recognizing that enrichment does provide us slightly more flexibility in how we support kids academically after school and what's allowed and what isn't. So I just, I, I will, I have just uh, another comment, but I just wanna pause there, just superintendent in case you'd like to, uh, there doesn't, I don't require a response, but just in case you wanna, <laughs> before I forge ahead. No, I'll just, I'll just note that we've had um, similar th considerations around the extended learning and just the, the restrictions that we have and know that that's, uh, um, as you already alluded to, it's a statewide issue. So trying to be in compliant with that, but also looking how we can expand beyond that when possible. Yeah, yeah. So I really, I'm pleased to hear and really grateful uh, Executive Director Williams and we'll look forward in future updates on how your conversations go with schools and trying to help them figure out some way to kind of enhance that so that a kid can have enrichment uh, you have you know extended learning, but also can have a chess club if that's what you know if that's what they want, right? Like a school at Pillsbury, for example, for many years, many many years, had a chess club and they were really proud of it, and then they lost that opportunity and they haven't been able to figure that out for probably ten years, right? Like in community education, they're surrounded by community education directors. So and Sheridan lost their Beacons program because they're not not a six eight school, and that's what Beacons is for. So okay. Then the second, um, I don't want to take too much time, so I just want to also just highlight uh, when we talk about our partners with the with the child care, the after school care, and I agree, we need to have child care option. For, we don't want to assume that families in certain neighborhoods don't need child care. That's that's a um, 
that's a erroneous assumption. But I also want to highlight when we talk about our partners, what I didn't hear tonight, and I think it's worth mentioning again, is that we have partners with the Park Department and Rec Plus. And so in certain schools where we don't see Minneapolis kids, and certainly the neighborhood I represent, Rec Plus is very popular, it's well liked, and it certainly it's it's no no um, no shade on community ed, but it's nearly identical as far as the mm -hmm. offering, right? Like as what it offers, and it would certainly never be necessary to have a Rec Plus and a Minneapolis Kids in the same building. So it's worth as you evaluate that. Um, I I'm sure you know this, but I'm hoping that you're thinking about that as well because that's very real asset to a community and does does. Um, take care of that need. And there are, of course, places that have neither, and that's where we should be focusing our energy as opposed to places that do have um, some access to childcare. So that's worth mentioning. And then the final comment, I promise, Chair Polly, is around athletics. And I just, as you commented, and it's fine, I mean, the way I heard you is you wanted to kind of note that there's these after school options, um, though athletics obviously is not part of community education, um, that's the athletic department. But I just again wanna note kind of publicly that athletics went through their own EDIA as well and is under their own kind of review all and monitoring process and have done some really good work as well. So I don't, I, as we kind of reflect upon kind of the complete after school offerings, I think we should be intentional about that, but not rather accidental. I don't want it to be this message of, well, they have athletics, so they're good, right? Like we don't wanna assume that and like as a reason that we don't need to maybe enhance the other enrichment opportunities. It's worth noting as the complete package, but it's certainly not the only thing. So thank you, Chair Polly, for your indulgence. Thank you, Director Arneson, for those questions and comments. I see uh, Chair Ellison, is your hand up? Yes, it Perfect. is. Perfect. Thank, thank you so much. I have just one question. I'm looking, I'm, I was looking at the slides where we talked about number of students who participate in percentages. Um, and I'm just looking at our capacity, wondering about our capacity. Would more students be participating in, I think I'm looking mostly at athletics and Minneapolis kids, um, if we had more sites, if there were more opportunities for them, would we have more students participating? Chair Ellison, if I may ask uh, Executive Director Williams, can you kind of speak to the Minneapolis kids portion of it? I know that's one that has been um, robustly uh, you know, discussed in the past about availability? Yeah, um, yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so for Minneapolis kids, we know that we, we typically do have waiting lists, you know, on a, at, a lot of, at a lot of our sites, um, but those are still regional at the same time. So that doesn't mean that if we had more Minneapolis kids in zone, in zone one, that there'd be more people attending attending that, but the sites that we do have, the 22 sites we do typically have um, waiting list. And then, um, and, and, and just to, uh, to, uh, to comment on, on Director Arneson, we, yes, we do also partner very closely with uh, Red Plus as well, so you're correct in that. So. Thank you. So, so I think that just to, you know, I think when it comes to capacity, it also is about space. Too, you know, because we can have, you know, we can be within a building, and you know, we we allocated so much space, and then you know, then you have the staff fit and things of that nature. So we have waiting lists expanding to different locations doesn't necessarily mean we'll have more students. Okay, um, so I'm just like, it's, I'd be interested to to know where we have waiting lists, and then what the reason is we have not been able to expand. Is it space? Is it staffing? Um, is it cost? So just you know, not tonight but if I could get that information. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Ellison. Um, I really appreciate the presentation, all the information I learned a lot today. Um, and as been mentioned, I think the most critical aspect is this, you know, kind of what do we do differently as a result of what we learn? And I think that processing and receiving updates on that work is a really important way to, to be accountable. To that end, Superintendent Graff, I'd be happy to work on creating space for some sort of regular update on at least EDA is requested by the board here in policy committee, as it seems to be a good fit. Yeah, I would definitely support that. Uh, you think, I think I heard Senior Officer Moore, you know, as the status of where we are now would be to monitor and to bring that information forward. So, um, you know, maybe we can 
coordinate a schedule that works for the policy committee calendar and um, provide those on a regular basis. Thank you, yeah, I think that would be great. And as we turn our attention you know, to the next EDI project, following the June timeline put forward by Senior Officer Moore, I will plan to bring forward a proposal next month for our committee to recommend that an EDA be conducted on external school and parent guardian groups, including PTOs, PTAs, school and parent foundations and site councils. I know this is a topic many of us have heard about over the past few years in particular, and an EDA would help inform how to move forward, especially considering that a, a few policies related to this are, are up for review. So seeing no additional hands, oh, oh, sorry, uh, Superintendent Kraft. Thanks, Chair Paul. Just, just to that point, um, I think what we would like to be able to do is maybe bring some of those policies forward that we know exist currently and kind of a, just start the conversation around what we'd be looking at um, as, a, as a basis for understanding like next steps going forward. So if you're in support of that, we'll pull together that information and have that for the next policy committee. That would be great. Yeah, I think we'd appreciate that as a committee. I'm um, seeing no additional hands. Um, Superintendent Graff, Senior Officer Moore, Executive Director Williams and team, thank you for your essential work on this. We'll now move to new business, which includes our continued process to revisit policies that have gone some time without revision. We have two proposals here today as part of that process. Superintendent Graff, would you like to introduce these items? Sure, thank you, Chair Pauly. Uh, as you mentioned, two proposals tonight. Um, both of these proposals uh, address policies from the committee's review list, and uh, both recommendations would primarily be an updating language and formatting to our current standards. And so neither of these are uh, proposed changes are significant, uh, but I will ask Ryan to kind of walk through the, the changes for, for the board. Uh, Chair Polly, Directors, Superintendent, the first proposal before you is a revision to policy 5600, which is releasing children from school uh, to guardians and parent, parents. Uh, this policy, as referenced, has gone some time without amendment. Uh, in fact, it is currently, as it sits, a, a four-line policy. So we are proposing to rework it into our current standard uh, standards and formats of, outlined in a paragraph form of purpose and general statement of policy. Uh, as Superintendent Graff mentioned, there is nothing um, substantially different about this. It really clarifies the process that um, a parent or a guardian needs to prove who they are in order to pick up a child from school, which um, I think is, is pretty reasonable. Uh, regulation accompanying this would then outline the various ways that identification could be, um, could be provided, and uh, that is the proposal on 5600. Thank you, Ryan. Directors, I'll take a motion to forward the revision of policy 5600 to the full board with the committee's recommendation. So moved, Arneson. Thank you. I second Sierra Ali. Oh, thank you. So motion to forward the proposal to the full board is before us. For any discussion, please raise your hand to be recognized. Seeing none, uh, Ryan, will you please call the roll on the motion to refer? Arneson. Yes. Ali. Yes. Sorio. Yes. Ellison. Yes. Polly. Yes. Thank you. So that motion carries. Uh, Ryan, if you'd like to please go ahead with the next item. Yep, Chair Polly, Directors, this um, uh, proposal impacts two policies. Number one, it is a recommended repeal to policy 3250, which is called materials fees. As you can see here, it's a, a very brief policy that uh, says that um, we should budget for basic instructional supplies and that students uh, will provide their own uh, expendable and personal supplies. So the proposal would be to amend a policy 6450, which is currently titled pupil fees. And then following some of our updating, we're using the word student. Um, I think pupil may be slightly uh, a bit of an antiquated term. So we've up, been updating as we go along, the, changing the term to student fees. So it would strike most of what's currently there and reformat again, like the previous proposal into our current standard, uh, standard formatting practices and would insert the language that uh, is being repealed from the, the other policy I mentioned. So it just folds that right back in here under uh, 2D. You can see that again uh, with changing the terminology from students and the pronoun he instead would same ha have the same provision that we would budget for instructional supplies for students. Uh, those are the recommended changes on this proposal. Chair Polly. Thanks, Ryan. Directors, I'll take a motion to forward the revision of policy 6450 
in the repeal of policy 3250 to the full board with the committee's recommendation. So moved, Arneson. Is there a second? A second, Ellison. Thank you. A motion to forward the proposal of the full board is before us. For any discussion, please raise your hand to be recognized. Seeing none, Ryan, will you please call the roll on the motion to refer? Arneson. Yes. Ali. Yes. Sorio. Yes. Ellison. Yes. Polly. Yes. Thank you. That motion carries. We will, excuse me, we will see both proposals for a first reading at the April business meeting. That concludes our agenda for the afternoon. I will now take a motion to adjourn. So moved, Arneson. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Ellison. Thank you. So it's been moved and seconded to adjourn this meeting. Ryan, will you please call the roll? Arneson. Yes. Ali. Yes. Sorio. Yes. Ellison. Yes. Polly. Yes. Thank you, Ryan. So that motion carries and we are adjourned. Our next policy meeting is scheduled for April 27th. Thank you. <laughs>